All right. So, welcome to another episode of Thin Coat of Varnish. I've never tried to do a live stream painting version of it. I don't know if it will work. I think I got maybe too many wires. But yeah, I wanted to talk about some things I have going on here. And um, why not do some painting along while I do that? <laughs> Half my palette is just covered by everything I have in front of me. So let's see if this works out. I might have to figure out a different way to do this or else I don't know how I'm going to paint like this every time I want to live stream and chat at the same time. I mean, I can see everything that's happening on my phone, but it's covering up my palette kind of. So anyways, let's talk about some advice. <laughs> Have you guys, um, can you see my, my question that I have there. Anyone want to chime in with any uh, good advice you guys have gotten in your painting lives or art lives? Doesn't have to necessarily be about painting, but advice about art you guys have gotten that stuck with you as being either really good or really dumb. That's a topic I want to discuss, but I want to see if anybody wants to lead off yet. Yeah. So I've been working with a lot of cold wax lately. I don't know if I used it in the under painting of this one yet, but it's been a lot of fun messing around with cold wax medium because it's so different from from other painting oil paint mediums. It has a totally different texture quality to it, and you change the properties of it when you heat it up and as it melts it becomes waxier and the paint the paint stiffens up it doesn't really dry but it does become uh harder to move around on your palette or not palette but on your what do you call it your your painting so that lets you do all sorts of interesting things with it. You could scumble a lot easier. You can um, layer easier as well. So, I don't know if I have any relax on my palette right now, but I should put some down so I could demonstrate to you guys in real time how it works. But in the meantime, any of those topics you guys want to chime in on them as I live paint here. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, Greta. <laughs> Long time no see. One lousy piece of advice I received years ago was don't throw anything away. It may be valuable someday. Oh, man. Yeah, that could get out of control. Especially as a student trying to learn, there's plenty of stuff you'll want to throw away. Um, I, I'm i glad I held on to some of my student work. Um, I try not to throw it all away, 
but there's definitely a lot of junk <laughs> in that um, pile of of stuff I produced as I was learning to paint and all that. So, um, yeah, that is terrible advice. <laughs> I would say don't throw everything away for sure, but uh, not throwing any of it away. I think that's that's just a good way to keep your house all cluttered <laughs> or make a mess. I mean. Did a hoarder tell you that? <laughs> I'm curious as to who told you that. Was it a teacher or a, or just some acquaintance or a fellow artist? So I'm just kind of rendering out the form here. I'm not um, going to commit to anything too quickly yet. I'm just painting on an old piece of mat board, so it's a little wonky. So how about some good advice? Um, the very, that's probably a fellow art student who was a year or two ahead of me. So naturally they thought they knew something. <laughs> oh yeah. When you're a student, you don't know anything. Well, you think you do, but um That's a little bit like the third topic there, like hard and fast rules. There are so few of them in art and creating that it it's uh, you just don't know which ones are are ones that really apply to you. And everybody tends to speak in absolutes, <laughs> at least the the more insistent people, the people who want to make it sound like they know what they're talking about, they speak in absolutes. And when it comes to art, they're very opinionated people, aren't they? So something like that, I'm wondering if nowadays they still live by that or they'd be like, oh, well, that's dumb. <laughs> Like, I was an idiot for thinking that when I was young. But maybe they got a spouse that made them throw everything out. <laughs> So in this painting, I'm just kind of purposely extending out the color of a figure into the background for other things I want to do with it. And I'll come back in with more paint over it to cut back into the figure and redefine that boundary of the form. And uh, some good advice I got early on that was something that um, 
painting teachers told me was to squint. <laughs> now it's such an automatic thing to squint for me that I don't even think about it. But I'm curious, does anybody not know the reason you squint while you paint? Let me know. Because it's such a thing that I take for granted at this point that I'm wondering if other people are like, what are you talking about squinting? <laughs> This isn't crimson, but it's a earthy violet. I don't even know what color this is exactly, but let's see what happens when we use it. Didn't really change much now, did it? <laughs> oh, here we go. That's a nice color. Mixed with a little ultramarine, becomes something else. Well, in case you're listening and uh, listening later and can't chime in, squinting is to compress all the values down in your eyes as you look at a subject. It's a great way to see where um, the value pattern of what you're painting and it simplifies everything and makes it a lot easier to organize on your painting. And it's just a really basic thing that you can do anytime and you can change your focus you can half squint you can um, squint to the point that you're almost closing your eyes and the whole idea is to see what um, the simple most graphic shape would be with um, so yeah squinting is such a valuable part of my painting practice that it's easily one of my best piece of art advice I've ever gotten So, I'm trying to do some weird things here. Uh, I'm starting to get a little too muddy, so let me scrape away some of this paint. So, it's starting to become very abstracted. <laughs> I mean, 
it started out pretty abstracted today to begin with, but it's a uh, youtube.com slash main loop. I asked this on the <laughs> speaking of waiting to dry. I asked this as part of a post that I made for, uh, for our guest Fernando Reyes, he talked about not really being into Matisse until he saw a show and was blown away by the work in person. And I posted something about that on our Waiting to Dry. Um, Thing, our Instagram channel and I asked if there were other people who as artists you didn't get at first and didn't until later on you saw their work maybe in person or something and it blew you away and now you're like a huge fan of um, there's been other people that on the podcast people have talked about before. Uh, Jason, I'll get to your question in a bit. Um, and so, like, Hiroshi Sato, Dega was one of those people for him. But I'm curious if there's anyone out there for you guys that whose art you didn't get at first and now you're way into them or they become one of your favorites or something, maybe not even your favorites, but you just appreciate them a lot more now. Um, a lot of people said Van Gogh. I think that's a, a pretty common answer for that question. And so, Jason, to answer your question, uh, yes and no. <laughs> I am still planning on doing some of the Painted Roses stuff, but um, I found myself very limiting or yeah, self-limiting in the way that I could treat that subject. And I wanted to break out and do something that explores more of a painterly approach, not so tight, a loose direction in the figure and everything that I just wasn't giving myself to the chance to do too much in that series the way I was doing it so I'm doing these almost as an experiment to see how far I could push myself away from really tight rendering and a really clearly defined beginning middle and end to a painting so what I hope to learn by doing these is a new way to approach my other series that I still am hoping to, to go back to later, but with a different um, a different approach. I was just doing that series the same way for too long. So I wanted to break out and do something completely different for a little while. And I have ideas for this series that I think will make it a little e more easily accessible to the average viewer. Because I feel like painters really eat this stuff up. <laughs> Fellow painters love to see paint pushed around and people exploring the form in interesting ways. But we're around it all the time. We see painting so often that we become a little bit desensitized to um, 
certain ways of painting. And so it becomes a thing where you almost have to do it just to not go insane, painting the same way over and over again. Or maybe some people are completely fine with doing that. Uh, but at any rate, it's easy to get too deep in the weeds when it comes to exploring this sort of thing. So I think it's important to have a way to get people back to reality a bit after pushing the boundaries of paint. And I think you can do that um, without... Uh, or there's a there's an interesting middle ground to take that, or not even a middle ground, like almost a third way to go with that. I, as I go further along with this series, I'll be able to to express that more. Uh, yours and Martin Campos videos are my life on Instagram. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Yeah, Martin's awesome. I like his his work a lot. Um, I listened to him on a recent episode. Well, maybe it wasn't that recent, but an episode of, uh, I think it was uh, Gently Does It, the John Dalton art podcast. And I was really into what he was saying. And I'd already liked his work, but listening to him speak about his work a little more got me that much more into it, which fortunately is usually the case when I hear artists speak about their artwork unless they're just really bad at talking about their artwork and don't realize that <laughs> uh, you can usually learn a lot by listening to them speak about it but most people who or most artists who don't want to talk about their work won't. <laughs> so they tend to not really want to put themselves out there in that way, which I was that way for a really long time. It's only recently that I started doing the podcast and now these vlogs that are more interested in talking about my work and it's also helped me figure out why I paint the way I paint. Not that I figured it out really, but thinking out loud about it helps me try and organize my thoughts about it better, which will hopefully lead to figuring things out in my painting as I paint again. So as a student, I really underestimated my, or the power of the thought behind the work. I was just so into, um, exploring the form for form's sake which even this series I'm working on right now, these little experiments are that in, in a way. Um, the thing is I do have some more thought behind it, which is why I'm painting them now the way I do. But that was kind of a, a bad, uh, not rule, but just a bad way of thinking that I had about my work as a younger student was that the art should speak for itself or not that the art should speak for itself because at a certain or to a certain degree I do still believe that wholeheartedly <laughs> but the idea that 
words aren't meant to enhance the work. And that it's kind of a cop out <laughs> to use words to enhance the thought behind the painting is not right to me. <laughs> and I think it was born out of the idea of being too shy and unsure just about life in general, but uh, about my art that it was easy to believe that. And I didn't even think of it as a rule. It was just more of a thing where I almost uh, resented having or other people who who I perceived to be getting by on being able to to market crappy work. <laughs> and some of the work was probably genuinely crappy, but a lot of the I'm sure there's plenty of work that if I looked at now, I'd understand it a lot more after painting for, um, God, at this point, 18 years. So there's a lot you can learn about and will learn about painting, just doing it for long enough. Living in the world and, and seeing more art. Um, here's a, a artist who I didn't get at first, but am now very much into Richard Diebenkorn, Bay Area abstract artist who his work is very abstract, yet a lot of it is based on reality. His work uh, that he first started getting best known for was based off of aerial views of cities and, you know, man-made structures and stuff like that. Farms even. So, uh, his work, as I've studied design and other creators who work with shape and color and not even so much form, creating an interesting pattern on a two-dimensional surface. The more I understood the difficulty involved in, in making a painting or just a, any type of image in that matter, the more I understood why people like deep and corn the way they do. And I'm now one of those people. So yeah, if there's anything that, or any artists that you guys didn't get, like, um, um, Here's another one. De Kooning, I still am not a big fan of him, but I like the work a lot more than I used to. It's hard to see. see if I get these little ears. That's a lot better. Alizar and Crimson is a very important paint color for me. It you just don't even realize it until it's not there.
there's a phthalo green alizarin crimson mixture I'm making here to get that dark. Putting in some of that into my, or putting some ivory black in there to get some of the deepest darks. I'll add some medium in it to make it that it's not too, it doesn't dry too matte. That always helps keep it dark, keep my darks dark. thing about these paintings is that they're so loose that nothing has to be too precious about them. I can go in and kind of destroy any part of it that I've made here at will. And I'm feeling like I need to do that a bit with this piece. It's not really going the way I want. And I, I know why. <laughs> it's because I'm distracted by by looking at my phone and painting, but um, anyways, when that happens, all I need to do is scrape down. The thing about scraping it too is that you usually get some interesting unintentional marks that you can hopefully build off of as well. So I can scrape down to almost the bottom layer. If I really want to get rid of stuff, which I kind of do, <laughs> throw some solvent. Let that do its thing for a bit. And where is my rubber roller? Okay, now that I've moved the solvent around, makes it easier to scrape back down. So I'm going to try and incorporate some of what's left over into the painting. It's something I've done in some of these other pieces. So this might look pretty drastic, but it's part of the process. can also bring back in some of the parts that I didn't wash away with solvent back into the parts that have the solvent and it kind of blends together between the two things there so yeah there's some neat stuff happening there now that I don't hoping to preserve some of so okay and maybe I don't want to use um, a filbert bristle filbert maybe I'll go back to uh, a monk a mongoose here. See what happens here. It's a little softer of a touch. Didn't quite work for me to do it the other way. Or not other way, but just a, maybe not the right tool for what I wanted to do. Um, 
think I want to try and reestablish the boundaries of the figure here. I think I'm losing that maybe a little too much. I like how sharp these brush strokes are. It really sets off how loose and soft the way I painted the the rest of the the form happening in there. These days I'm really trying to learn what I can about edges. And really one of the best ways is just by pushing the limit of of like form definition here and just strategically placing hard edges back into where they will best describe the form without having to render too much. So by putting these hard edges around that kind of define the form, you can do a whole lot within that boundary. So yeah, this is a lot better now. Get this knee going here. Maybe it's hard to tell what's happening <laughs> if you're not the person looking or painting this. Anyone feel free to chime in with any questions about the painting itself. I want to talk more about the topics, but I'm not getting the engagement with them that I wanted. So I'll open up the chat to anything else you guys might want to be discussing. So other things I got going on coming soon, um, the painting that I did that I titled Florosculism, it's, um, I just sent out to Nucleus Portland and that show is opening next month, but they always want, galleries always love it when you send your work early. so. They make the deadlines pretty far in advance of the actual show, but I get why. <laughs> they need to make sure they get all the, the art they need for it. So I'm ready for that. Would love to be able to go up there, but I don't know if that's going to be something I can do. But that show, I believe, opens beginning of February. So if you are in Portland, Check out Nucleus Gallery. They're doing awesome stuff up there. I really wanted to see the the Nicholas Aribe Benjamin Bjorklund show that they did there a few months ago. That would have been amazing. It just seemed a bit too expensive to get up there. At the time, I had other 
things going on. I had to pay for it. That wouldn't have made sense to not pay so I could go see a gallery show. But it could be one of those things that I regret. <laughs> Play your crows. So I'm going to start a podcast waiting for Sergio. Oh, you can get a lot of guests for that podcast. I think Josh would be your your first guest. I am late to everything. <laughs> Always been that way. Punctuality is not a strong suit of mine. It's like, are you late, late? Or just normal Sergio late. <laughs> I think my friends understand that about me at this point. Um, that shoulder isn't ever really... I'm in trouble with this shoulder here. <laughs> it's a temperature thing. I want it to become a little more rounded. Every time I do it, it kind of screws up the form there. So let's see what I could do. I don't know if that color is too gray now. Okay. I could feel the cold wax starting to settle up. Which I kind of want to have happen. Let's me do some interesting scumbling along the surface of it. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a lot you could do with oil paint in its different stages of drying time, so... You just, after a while, after painting with it for so long, you learn, just like watercolor, what's the best thing to do in its different phases of drying. It's starting to look a bit like what I'm going for up here. Yeah, maybe I'll wait for that part to dry before I'm able to do more to it. Maybe that's what I'll do with this painting at this stage is to leave it purposely a little more angular and blocky than I have been.
know if I like that part there. It's always something nice about having the the tone of the canvas show through a bit. In this case, not a canvas, but the gessoed mat board. <laughs> What do you guys think about the topics today? Do you guys get any good or bad advice as students or just in general as artists? How about are there any artists who you thought kind of sucked? <laughs> early on in your development as artist, but now you really love. So earlier I was kind of struggling with making this into a, a figure that reads well with the anatomy and all that yet yeah, being um, being interesting as a painting so trying to make the anatomy read it better again working on her neck there. So this is a Trakel brush. My favorite bristle brushes to play with. Okay, there is some parts of the figure that I need to outline a bit. That leg read better. I think orange is a good bet there. So, working on the legs here, and there are a couple other things going on that related to the legs, but don't quite tie into them too much.
There's not much I can do this painting right now. I could work on it some more, but there are parts of it that maybe I should wait until they are dried a bit more. I'm always in awe of people who can make yellow ochre feel like the brightest, most sunlit color of yellow. Especially back in the days of when there wasn't such pigments as cadmium. It was all via color temperature relationships and value. Just amazing. If you guys aren't familiar, look up Sir Henry Rayburn. One of the great portrait painters of England. Amazing work. Um, before the times of Sargent. There's a painting in the Legion of Honor in San Francisco that of his that I always make a point to look at. If I can. Okay, well, not a lot to talk about right now. I'm just painting. Probably not going to do a whole lot more to it. <laughs> kind of not in the best shape to be painting right now. But I want to finish what I started in this part of the process. Uh, I feel like this, there needs to be more narrow or go up more. It is late for me to be trying to paint seriously. <laughs> Introducing a bit of orange into the chest, just to warm it up a bit. Recently, I was convinced that orange is actually the, the warmest color on your palette. Because it's right in the middle of red and yellow. And the further yellow you go, you'll eventually hit green. And the further red you go, you'll eventually hit purple. So orange is right in the middle. So <laughs> having that pointed out convinced me enough. What do you guys think? Do you have a different take on that? Can you convince me that that take is wrong? going to take a while. You better bring some heavy knowledge to knock that thought off its pedestal. <laughs> so what do you think? I think that's all I want to do in this painting. For now, I mean, there's definitely for sure I could do more to it to refine some of the form here, but I'm going to wait on that. This was a 
interesting experiment. Probably not going to do it this way anymore. I found it a little too cumbersome. Having all these wires in my way. <laughs> Trying to talk and paint about serious subjects. Or maybe not even serious, but stuff I really want to talk about. But trying to paint at the same time. A couple of people chimed in, but I feel like I'm shortchanging one or the other. Can't have a good conversation while I paint. Can't paint and have a really good conversation at the same time. I mean, I kind of can, but not really. I feel like I'm not doing the best painting I can if I'm trying to talk and have all this junk in the way. <laughs> so, well, I'm glad you were able to hang out and check out what I've been doing here. But, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to have to do it without all this stuff and have a little bit less distraction as I paint. So... I'm glad that you hung out, but uh, it's a good experiment. See if I can make sure so much isn't in my way for next time. Well, this was cool. Um, all right, so I will see you next month. Hopefully I have something that I'm more interested in showing you. Not that I'm not interested in showing you guys my process here. Um, this will be a rare glimpse to see this part of it for free. Normally, uh, I have this behind my Patreon paywall, but I don't feel like this was my best effort. I was just a little bit too distracted with all my stuff that I have in front of me here. So, yeah, anyways, I will talk to you next.